Hello there, my name is Florian. I work as a dive consultant for a company called Axis. I am very passionate about F Sharp and open source, and my background is mainly in web and cloud applications. And today I'm going to talk about how formatting F Sharp code works. You can see this in action in the video. Um, I'm inside my code editor, I just reach for that reformat uh, command, and the whole text starts to you know, scramble again and it gets um, gets reformatted. Under the hood, a library called Phantomus is being used to achieve this. And today I'd like to explain how does this Phantomus thing high level work, how you can use it, and I'd also tell you a bit about my journey in the open source world, because Phantomus is like my first thing I became the maintainer of, so it's also a, a bit of an interesting tale there. So first off, what is Phantomus exactly? It um, is an open source project, you can find it on GitHub, and it started somewhere in 2013. It takes your F-sharp code and it completely reformats it based on a standardized configuration. The project was started by Ando Fang and was released both as a command line tool and a Visual Studio extension. So the name Phantomus uh, is referring to a character in fictional works of Pierre Sylvestre and Marcel Annette. So there used to be this running joke that every open source uh, f -star project needed to start with an F. So that's where, where the name came come from. It was a beloved character by Aang. And Phantom also shares the um, same Greek root to Phantom, which kind of fits the narrative as formatting f -star code can be a very mysterious thing. So to put it simple, all Phantom kind of does is it takes an input string, it takes a configuration and it returns a string. It's more complicated than that, but um, that's a bit of the, the essence of what the library itself does. Now, Phantomus uses a library called the f -sharp Compiler Service. This is the f -sharp Compiler, but it ships as a NuGet package and it exposes different APIs within the compiler. So when you compile f -sharp code, you can see this in the diagram, actually a different set of phases happened. And the one that Phantomus is using is the, um, the lexing and the parsing, so where we use the, the tokenizer and the untyped AST. And AST stands for Abstract Syntax Tree, that's kind of a representation of the code you wrote as a, as a string, as a test like text, and then you sort of change that into an f -sharp object model. So that's um, what Phantom is then uses to print it back out in that standardized way. Now there are uh, four main building blocks when it comes to transforming source codes to formatted code. We create that abstract syntax tree using that NuGet package. We then create something we call trivia. We sort of transform both of these things to writer events and we merge them back together um, until we, we have that formatted code. Uh, it doesn't exactly happen in that order, but you'll, you'll get the main idea of it. So let's take the, the following example. We're, um, we're looking at some F-sharp code here and it doesn't really seem all that bad, so it doesn't need that much formatting. But what we have here is we have like a record, some left bindings, uh, we have some code comments, and we'll just see how Phantomus processes all of this and gets it back to that formatted code. Um, when we work on Phantomus, we actually use a debug tool, um, like a Fable application we, we made a while ago, and that kind of illustrates how everything works very neatly. So let me just switch to that. So I'm here in my browser, we're looking at Phantomus tools, and just like on your left, a panel where we can type our source code or input. And on the right, there's a couple of different tabs that actually highlight different phases of what Phantomus actually does. So maybe let's start um, with like the output. So this is input, then on the right panel we have some output. You can see not that much changed. But um, maybe the first thing to highlight here is that we have this button, looks wrong, create issue. If we open that, we actually go to our GitHub page and it creates a template of an issue. And there we can see what was the before, what was the after, and then you can like describe what the problem is there and uh, see which version of Phantomus was used, what kind of settings were, were in there. So this is really like a, a good start um, when you're using Phantomus and you found encounter some of an issue they can like report it via our tool. But if I were to go uh, back to that tool, then we can see we have some multiple tabs. So the, the thing I mentioned is that we create this abstract syntax tree based on the f -sharp compiler. So it's like the f -sharp compiler, but not going all the way to binary, but you're um, going to uh, an intermediate phase. 
and it creates a sort of tree shape. So this is an F# -sharp object model because the F# -sharp compiler is written in F# -sharp itself. And what we're looking at here is like the implementation file. And I'll admit, abstraction to XP can be very scary if you never encountered um, something like that before. But the uh, the thing is, you'll, you'll sort of recognize a certain stuff. So this first thing we, we notice we have like a type format config. So we should find this type over here. We see that we have like a module or a namespace, anonymous module, and then we get types, type definition, and to eventually go to that format config. So that kind of matches what we had there. And the format config is a record type, so we can see simple records. So even if you have like no idea how this um, object model works, you sort of can like piece things easily together um, based on some words you, you find or identifiers, like this page width or this, um, this indent. If you scroll down, we have like this left binding over here. Um, notice that this is a constant. So we have some like uh, primitive data types here. We have another type and then another left binding. So maybe next thing that's interesting, if I go back to the slides, we have some code comments there. And if I go back to the tool and like look for those comments, let me just try and grab that. You can see that no leaf in the, the node tree actually has access to one of the um, comments. So what I'm trying to say here is this AST doesn't contain all the information. But if I go back to the last tab, where we see the form and the results, you do see that we're able to restore uh, the code comments. So how do we do that? Well, in one of the other tabs, we use the tokenizer uh, file of the compiler. So tokenizing is actually something that happens even before you create the AST tree. You sort of um, take every chunk of text or, or like little bit of code within the, the, you know, the entire code file and you sort of say, okay, this is a line comment. And if I click on this, you can see that, okay, the content is this first three slashes. We're defining this as a line comment. And this contains all the information over there. So we sort of puzzle things together and all the like tokens that match up and, and are like an individual thing, we call those trivia. So trivia are like things we found over here in the um, tokenized phase, but are not present in the abstract syntax tree. So if I head over to my trivia tab, I'll show what we eventually already found. So you can see this by trivia here. The first thing we found was that line comments, but then we found new line. So new lines are also not part of your AST. Um, it really only says where do certain code constructs begin because that's the information the compiler needs to eventually go to um, binary. So it leaves all, uh, all the stuff like this out and we can see some new lines and we also have this number. So numbers are a bit of an edge case. They're, they're part of your AST, but they're already written into a, a more optimized format. So we have this number over here with this U, which is, I think, bytes or binary. But if I then head back to my AST, then we can see in the select binding, there is a constant, but it's already formatted in integer format. So what happens there is that the compiler optimizes files, but when we go to the output here, we want to see the original uh, written format. So that's where we parse in the trivia, um, the number itself. Um, the next thing, once we've collected our trivia, once we identified all those things, we sort of need to assign them back to trivia nodes. Trivia nodes represent ranges that kind of match the AST tree because you're going to traverse the entire tree at the end. So everything that's in the tree and well, the trivia needs to be assigned to nodes of the tree. So if you sort of um, do this little exercise, we have this anonymous module, which then contains content before. So before the entire module even starts, on line four it starts, we have those two con comments and like a new line. So the record has a content after, the left binding, so um, content itself or the number. And that's kind of how we, we puzzle these things back together. And then lastly, um, when we traverse the entire tree, we create something called write events. Now we don't really have this in the tool, but these are like a set of instructions that we use um, before we print out the eventual results. It's sort of a mini event sourcing kind of thing. And 
the benefit of that is that we create instructions which will eventually use to write. It's like um, when you write a piece of paper, you're not writing it directly. You're just like dictating what needs to be written, and then at the end, someone just like writes it all down. So you sort of save the ink if you like made a little mistake and need to um, go over things again. So that's kind of the the gist of it. Um, I'll actually show this in action when we sort of debug our tool. So Phantomus is both like a uh, library and command like tool. So we can go over here to the code formatter, so like the public API. And if I were to debug the file, yes, let me just debug the default. We'll have our little example snippet coming in, and um, so then we'll see the different phases, what it actually does with that NuGet package with the compiler, and etc. Okay, so it came in here, it sounds like the file name, the contents of the file, the configuration options, uh, the checker, etc. And then the first thing we do is we use the F-sharp checker, which is part of the, it is what the actual F-sharp compiler will use. So it's part of that NuGet package and then we'll create the abstract syntax tree ourselves. So if I continue, I can see that we'll have the tree over here. So it's collecting the data. You see it's an implementation file. Um, this represents exactly what we saw in the debug tool. And then we're going to collect the trivia uh, based on the tokens that are already there. So if I check for the tokens, these are just going to match up with everything we uh, saw in the debug tool. So you see each individual token. We'll try and get that trivia out there and then we'll assign the trivia to the trivia nodes. So a bit further around the line, we have like everything in place. We have the configuration, we have the trivia, we kind of know uh, how we can process it. And then we sort of traverse the tree in something we call the code printer, and these like um, so go over everything and then create the uh, right events. And the right events are then a set of instructions of how the code uh, ends up or needs to be printed out. So if I just go quickly into these right events to give you like an example of how this looks like, you can see you remember the the snippet started with those two code comments, so I'm actually expecting that the code comments are uh, the first write instructions. And you can see that indeed the first thing is just yeah, write that uh, triple slash comment out and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So most line we just write what write what writes until we go to like write next line, et cetera. Or we do the indent by, so sometimes you want to indent things and uh, set it at a fixed column and restore indentation. That's kind of the tricky part is your code digresses. Multiple events pop in, but then, um, yeah, sometimes you want to say, okay, these events are going to put everything on the next line, and it's going to be, it's not going to be respecting the page width, and then say, mm, nah, let's just skip those events, let's um, take a few off, then try it again in a different way, and that's kind of how, um, how we have different uh, formats. And then the last thing we can see, this is like the formatted results, which is also what the tool mentions. And that was formatting in action. So Phantomus allows for some um, user-specific settings. I'll, um, I'll show this again in the, inf in the online tool that sort of influences how those write events uh, are to exist. So, if I were to go to this, you can see I have a, a record type over here, I have an instance of a record, I have a, uh, an update record expression, I have an object expression. And if I just use the standard formatting, it will uh, print all these things out, sort of like they, they already were. So the curly brace matches the beginning, and then it matches the end, and then the columns are actually different. So if I change one of the settings, like to a um, that would be, yes, multi-line block brackets on the same column, that's sort of setting I want. So if I set this to true, you can see that all of a sudden these things start to align if they're long enough. 
And the trick is there that um, if you look at the AST again, you can see that we have this record over here, which has the fields. And then if we scroll down, we have another record, but it's inside the let binding, and this was inside the type. So those are not the same records. And the AST combinations, so to say, are, are fairly large. So you need to take all these things into account when you create different settings um, to respect uh, all code behavior there. So to respect all the formatting. Um, the same with the object expression. You sort of want all these things to behave, but it's um, sometimes just requires a lot more attention and care um, to do all the, to make all the correct decisions based on the setting that's in there. Because when traversing the entire tree, you need to uh, really dig into all the possibilities that can happen there. Um, so that just to point out, some settings are like easy, and other settings require something to work. Okay. So how does one use Phantomus? Um, well, if you're using any uh, modern F# -sharp editor, it's already kind of there. Um, we ship it both as a NuGet package, as a DLL, and as a command line tool. Then the DLL gets picked up by editors. So FS Autocomplete is like a language server, which is empowering the INITE, the VS Code uh, plugin. And Jetbrake Writer does a similar thing. They use the DLL to then um, integrate it to their product into their F# -sharp, uh, plugin. So that's basically how we ship it. Um, when do we ship new versions? Well, kind of uh, if the compiler itself updates or if we're trying to match an editor's update. So it's a bit of a so, sort of a random uh, schedule there, but we sort of try and keep up and keep everyone uh, at, uh, happy. Cool. So, whoop, sorry, I have some computer issues here. Um, I'm going to explain how can you use Phantomus yourself. So I, I've told that if it's in the editor, you use you, know, you use the shortcut, and and all will go well. But um, what if you're what if you're you know using Notepad and you still want to have Phantomus? Then well, you can just use the command line tool, and it's fairly easy these days. So I just want to explain that. If I go back to my browser, I kind of want to use a real world example here. So. I thought it could be interesting to uh, format some codes that Vagif wrote. Vagif is one of the other speakers at this conference, so it could be cool. So let me just clone this repo. Uh, let's fire it up. I'm just going to create a quick clone of that. I'm going to sort of build and then format and then let's, let's just compare it before and after. So if I go to this event store viewer, I can see there is a uh, solution file, so let's just build that one. Just to be like really sure that it was already working before and after so that the formatter didn't break anything. Okay, good. So the client built. Uh, let's just open this quickly in VS Code. It's going to be a bit more friendly for my computer in terms of memory, I hope. So opening code. And then the first thing I'm going to do is actually create a .NET um, tool manifest, so you can say .NET new uh, tool hyphen manifest. And that's kind of how you install um, the local CLI tools um, these days with the .NET Core 3.x versions. So then we can say .NET tool install Phantomus hyphen tool. And I'm going to use a pre-release version, so I can pass in the version going to be 004, beta 001. And once that is installed, we can just uh, say .NET Phantomus and point to a directory. So let me just check. I actually want the source here. 
I want the source and then it goes directly to the client. So we can say, try and increase the font. Oh my, I never did it. So VS Code is kind of freaking out right now. Um, let's just skip the editor part. Uh, let's close this all together. I'll continue on the command line. <laughs> yes, I, I kind of know you're no longer responding. I'll just close all of this. Um, so as I was saying, you can just like points dot at phantomus and then say uh, let's do the source folder, the client folder over there, and let's hit dash r to like recursively um, parse all folders. And it's just processing each file. And that's um, going to be reformatted now. Just gonna try and open code again. And then if we go to the diff, see a couple of files changed. So the first time you do this, it's obviously going to change a lot. Um, one, I didn't put any specific uh, code settings there. It just like took the default stuff and, um, well, it just, um, it, it, you know, changes the fable code also a lot. Um, but the, the nice thing is it's, it's opinionated and it's going to be, you know, if you prefer a certain style, it's going to be always formatted in that style, which is really the benefit there. Um, you can also, with the command line tool, do like a check flag. So when you say, hey, wasn't my code formatted okay, according to the standards? And that's not like easy to do in a like CI, CD scenario. So when you check in the code, first checks, did you format everything? And if not, we'll just, uh, we'll stop running your pipeline. So I'm just going to move on to the presentation because my laptop is uh, giving me some headaches. You can also use Phantom as a library. Uh, the example I was going to give there is that you can um, use Phantom as to parse AST nodes you create by hand directly. So let me just try and get there. Yes, that still works. So what I'm doing here is I, I have an F sharp script. I'm referencing um, the compiler of Phantom and some other stuff. And I'm basically going to create my uh, little snippet here. And I'm going to say I have a module, I have a function A and B, and I'm going to count A and B together. And then I'm going to create um, these little like syntax expressions. This is the AST. I'm going to do this by hand with like the help of a helper library. And we're going to create our implementation file. And if we then uh, let's try and execute this, so this should give us the same tree as we had in like the online tool or definitely a similar tree. And the only real difference is that this isn't starting from actual source codes. So um, things like Alexa and the tokenizer weren't involved in this, but it's going to have um, the same results, only that everything is off on, on like line one, column zero, uh, because well, nothing was, was created from source. But if you have one of those trees for whatever reason, and you open Phantomus, the, the DLL, you can sort of format this as well and get the expected output. Now the cool thing you can do there is that it can um, be great for code generation. Uh, for example, you're um, doing like something with a SQL database and you inspect everything in your database and you generate your F sharp types uh, based on that. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of um, opportunity for like meta programming there as well. So let me just 
go back to the slides to get to the next part of our story. So I explained how Ventimos works, how you can use it yourself, but um, one other interesting thing here is that how did I, how did I end up getting involved in this? I, I mentioned that Ventimos wasn't created by me from, from the beginning, and um, you know, it sort of had a maintainer, and then it didn't have a maintainer, and then suddenly I picked it up. So that's kind of the story I also uh, want to tell here. It begins with a pull request to the f -sharp compiler itself. So there was this idea, because Phantom as heavily uses every um, type that's in the compiler, so why not merge it to the f -sharp compiler itself, and then have that NuGet package work to use this? directly expose the formatting surface. Um, which in itself is a very good idea, because everyone that then uses the actual compiler already has the formatting inside. So that's, um, that's a good thing there. Um, this was a community pull request, and Don Simon brought like, his feedback in the pull request. He said, OK, I'm, I'm agreed to have this, but he says it should be able to format the actual compiler itself because that's currently a publicly um, known largest F-sharp code base. So if you can format the hardest project of them all, it's probably going to be OK to, to assume that you can format everything, or more or less everything. So that's kind of uh, what Don's feedback was. And in the beginning, I, um, yeah, I don't really know how all this open source and F-sharp stuff works. Uh, I only knew that Microsoft was, you know, this was a .NET family kind of thing, so I assumed some engineer at Microsoft would eventually pick this up and then um, complete the missing gaps. But yeah, it was a long time ago. I had like nobody had this really works. So I sort of um, yeah, I sort of asked Don then directly like, what's the status on this? Any progress? And he said, yeah, it's up to the community to pick this up. And one of the next things, um, I enrolled myself in something that's called the F# -sharp mentorship program. So it's an initiative by the F-Sharp Foundation where they sort of pair a um, experienced F-Sharp user with a novice. And based on your interest in your time zone, they sort of uh, pair you and you can yeah, pick up something where you eventually spread some knowledge about the F-Sharp um, language. So at that point, it was like, OK, I, I kind of know the syntax of F-Sharp. Um, while ago, and I said, okay, I want to like, move forward. I want to invest in this. I really like this. So I enrolled in the mentorship program, and I got assigned with, uh, with Anthony Lloyd. And we together, um, yeah, we were like, paired, and it was all a bit of a free format. You, you were free to like, choose how you want to do this. Um, we, we had, like, with some delay uh, on my side, we, we had our first Skype call. And um, yeah, we, we made some introductions. He told me he was um, currently maintaining the Expecto library, which is like a, a popular uh, unit testing framework in F Sharp. And he told me that yeah, it could be interesting to like pick up another project you want. And that's also kind of what I told him. It's like I'm impressed how F Sharp people really yeah do something back for the F Sharp community. Like it's, it's uh, everyone sort of contributes and. I wanted to do something as well, and um, well, I, I sort of uh, said to the engineer, it's like, hey, this this Phantomus thing, I, I, I'm really missing this, this is like a pain I have myself. As a beginner, it's, it's hard to get all the new syntax in your head, and it would be easier if you just had like a formatter who showed me what is, what is okay without having to, I don't know, like wonder and look up another project, okay, hey, how does someone else format that? So it was like nicely, and I come from a, a C sharp and then more JavaScript background, and yeah, there you have like prettier, and it's always been there in Visual Studio, and it just works. You sort of expect it to happen in F sharp as well, and it wasn't there. So we were, uh, yeah, we were interested in seeing what this Phantomus project was all about, and we started by fixing a simple bug. And at the time, there were like there was no debug tool. I had no idea what the compiler or how the matter really, really worked, and in the AST, what, what all that was. So it was, it was challenging. It was, uh, it was in over my head, and it was, you know, sometimes it's just like good to, to find, um, find that overwhelming point and then slowly get over it. 
And that's kind of what we did. We migrated the code base. So it started in 2013. It was still the, like, the old MS builds uh, world. And we migrated it to .NET Core. So it was easier to uh, for people to contribute again, to fork again. And we updated the f -sharp compiler version. As the NuGet package evolved, but the project was dormant, it, uh, it got some ground again. And yeah, after a couple of months, we, we were able to get the original maintainer to, to approve our, our work, get it in there, and then get a release. So Aang isn't really involved in the F-sharp uh, spaces anymore, and so it was sometimes tricky to get a hold of him, but we got the new get keys and he said, okay, yeah, let's, uh, I'll let you guys publish this. Here. Congratulations, you're, you're the owner. I mean, I didn't really know it at the time, but it was like, yeah, cool, this is this is a good thing there. And all good projects sort of need some some buzz to get the word out. If you're like, Phantom is back, but a simple tweet doesn't do here. You need to like blog about these things. And I was, you know, I was excited. This was my first actual release that you know I wanted people to discover and I wanted people to get involved. So the the news was received well, and it was like a good closing to our mentorship because the mentorship program, well, it's, it's as I said, it's not that strict, so you can sort of choose how long you want to um, progress in it. But we haven't been doing it for, for a couple of months now, and uh, it was it was good to, to part ways. And I kind of knew enough to pick up uh, some more work. And about a month later, I met Don Sign, who is um, one of the creators of the F-sharp language. And I was able to go to NDC Oslo, and he was actually sitting there uh, during lunch. And yeah, I uh, I approached him. I was like, I was a bit nervous. Uh, maybe similar. <laughs> I'm a bit nervous at this conference, but it, it was you know I was like, hey Don, me Florian, I've been doing some of this Phantom stuff. Ever heard about it? And yeah, he knew. He he knew Ang, and uh, yeah, he was just impressed that, that the project was was picked up again by the community, and it was like good. And I've also like poked him. Hey, could we like moved from Dan from Ang's name to like the FS projects, which is a more of an organization within the community, so like other people can um, involve in it. And then I uh, I got the admin rights, so then it was truly the owner of, of the thing. But I'm not truly alone in this uh, story. There, there is another. There's another developer who sometimes contributed fixes to to Phantomus, um, and I. I'm very proud to say that uh, Niki Vanik, the nice gentleman on the left, um, has been my friend and my partner in crime in this whole adventure. Um, we first physically met in Fableconf at Berlin, and before that we were just two dudes on the internet. We like talked about it on the Slack channel, and it was good that we could poke each other's brains, but we had like no idea who we were. And yeah, it was just we we met at this conference and it just really clicked the the great ideas we, we had, like the um, debugging tool, it, it's all just innovation by, by physically meeting. So that's, uh, that's one of the wonderful things about conferences. And then this picture was actually a year later, uh, Fableconf Antwerp, and it was so great to see how, how much we, we grown together just by physically meeting. Um, this is like a first version of the um, debug tool that I showed you. So this really evolved in a couple of tools and emerged again. And, it was really, yeah, it was getting useful for the entire community because everybody that does something with like tooling also has uh, to do with AST. So the AST viewer was just interesting for us, but it was also interesting for other people. And it was really, yeah, the whole people could log issues online which really started to, to grow into adoption. And well, as there was a bit more and more hype around the project. It was cool to see that um, other people were contributing as well. Um, but uh, with, uh, how does the saying go? With uh, great power comes great responsibility. I sort of merged a pull request a bit too soon. Didn't really think about all the consequences. And yeah, something, not to, not gonna say horrible happened, but something pretty annoying happened. Um, we merged a pull request before the whole trivia idea. The way comments were preserved were like with scrambling the old tokens with the new tokens, and then, as I said, comments aren't part of the AST tree but are part of the tokens. So like, 
we figured figured out where the comment should be based on, on doing like a diff between the old and the new tokens. And someone had implemented a new feature that preserved the end of the line token from the original, which is the, the new one. And yeah, the, the, this sounds all a bit abstract, but what I'm trying to say here is that it was, you know, it had unit tests, but it really only worked in the default configuration. A lot of issues were reported. People sort of liked the feature, but it just had so many problems and we weren't really able to fix it. So that's kind of where, um, yeah, it's been bothering us for a while and it, the feature just had to go. I was willing to have like a breaking change just so we could really, really remove all that. And Unity actually talked to Don Sign about this. Like, is there any reasoning that comments are not part of the AST and um, like the, the little hacks we, we do to get all things right? And they basically said that, yeah, in time, the AST notes could be extended, but it's, um, yeah, it's just something that didn't really occur as a use case for the compiler because when a compiler just needs to go to binary, it doesn't really matter if the comments are there or not. But, you know, the, the two of them, we became thinking about what if we could extend the trivia note, uh, the, the AST notes, and then we, we got the trivia notes concepts. So we were very relieved that we could, like, um, really um, move forward and have, like, a, a fixed method of solving things because we, we had, like, a very strict process now. If something didn't go well with a comment, we could just say, oh, probably it's a trivia thing. So that's kind of where we, where we were able to move forward. But we kind of knew that it would be a lot of work. And I work as a consultant. Most of the time we do time and material and we support our customers with their existing development teams. So all this, at the, until this point I was telling, it was like, okay, f was the hobby and c -sharp was the day job. But as a consultant, yeah, I was sort of looking out and iterating a sharp opportunities. And in Belgium, that's a very um, difficult thing to find. So I kind of followed some, um, some leads in the jobs Slack channel, the Ipsar Foundation, and every once in a while something popped up and it was like, hey, um, I'm interested, or is it a remote position? Please, please, please. And yeah, that's, uh, that was a little bit of a hard thing to really find a lot of leads there, but Suddenly there was hope. An unexpected opportunity arose. The people of G Research are, um, they have like multiple F Sharp teams and they're really betting on it, but they acknowledge that the state of the F Sharp ecosystem isn't always that powerful um, when it comes to, you know, how to compare to other things. Like, um, yeah, editor supports um, C Sharp versus F Sharp. Any, pick any editors, C Sharp's gonna win that one. So. They kind of acknowledge that and they want to invest um, back into the uh, open source community. So they, they do this for multiple projects and they were looking for someone who could um, expand on the F sharp branch of things. So they were uh, willing to like fund an individual or a project and I reached out to them on Slack. We had a Skype call, things went well and we, we kind of found a match. And then there was hope. After some negotiations, because that was like the, the tricky part, I mean, there, there was a business side to things. It's just, um, I needed to, to get to our sales representative, like, hey, these guys are willing to invest. Can we like make an offer? Can you like make it work? And they agreed to a short contract. So one day in the week, I'm uh, able to work on F Sharp, on Phantomus to extend the tool to the things that um, G Research is currently missing. And it was like the best experience I've uh, ever had. It's, um, it's, it's really wonderful. It doesn't feel like work at all. And after the, the first like 10 weeks, I've um, presented what I had to the team because in the beginning I was just talking to the manager on the right here and never, never really directly to the team. Um, they kind of knew what I was doing, but I've never really shown any progress. And then I said, hey, this is a uh, debug tool. This is before, this is after. And then that's, that's kind of how it all works. And they showed, um, they showed enthusiasm, compassion, and appreciation every step along the way. So it was really, yeah, it was, it was very cool to, to speak to them because I could reach out for non-technical questions. I could reach out, hey, how would you typically do this or that in terms of how the style would. So they really had like an opinion on it. And that's, that's really something that boosted the project. 
And of course, it really fits together with the whole I need to fix something that was introduced later and the whole we need to refactor but there is no time. Well, well suddenly there was time. We had like a benevolent benefactor and yeah, that just opens doors and possibilities. So uh, eventually I was able to push out the next major release, which was my first major release, and we really were able to, to lay the foundations of the engine to like really improve of, of the way of working. And the cool thing is that I'm showing here a screenshot of a blog post, because every release needs a blog post, you need to make some buzz of all, of all these things. And it was cool that they transitioned from my personal blog, from my hobby thing, to my company blog. So, you know, this, this really was a work thing. It was, it was a really nice company endeavor here. Um, my work is not concluded. So the refactoring that happened in version 3 was only the groundwork. Uh, Phantom is currently follows something that's called the F-sharp coding format from Microsoft. It's a style guide. And it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy there. Because this style guide is based on the original style guide written by Aang, which is the creator of the Phantomus project. So that's kind of why we fulfilled these things. Um, but G Research had a very different opinion on it. So I was able to convince them to publish their own style guide, which they had internally for years. So just um, some minor things, uh, some major things they just don't agree on and do things fundamentally different, but have been doing it for years. And that kind of created a super new set of features. So there are now like more possibilities to tweak Phantom as how you want it to be. And that eventually led to um, more adoption because people yeah, are very picky about formatting. So the fact that they can have like more control, find great tunings of how things should be, that's kind of where, um, where this project really grew. And um, I'm currently actually working on the next major version. Um, which isn't all that breaking, just some settings disappear and it's, you know, semantic versioning. Um, but yeah, it's, it's looking very promising and I'm, I'm feeling really supreme. I'm like, I'm on top of the mountain here, um, looking back at the, where I came. So that, that's really great. But there's one thing you notice on this picture, that the guy is pretty much alone and you can only cover so much ground and it wants to like go faster and do more, but it's, it's only been like you, Dick, and I, and meh, it's like we need to get more people involved. And that's kind of what this talk today is about. I'm, uh, I'm doing this whole idea that I'm calling the road to adoption. It's just a fancy name of getting more people involved in the project. So I actually started a YouTube channel where I create little videos that explain um, what I explained at the beginning, but in a bit more detail. And every week I sort of launched a new thing or explained, hey, how do I solve this bug? Because at the end, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, but if you teach a man to fish, you, you feed him for a lifetime. And that's really what I'm, what I'm trying to do here. I want to have this whole F-sharp community backing. If you find an issue with Phantomus, you can just solve it yourself. That's kind of, I want to have the whole herd uh, together on this. And yeah. This, this whole scheme has actually already been paying off as I was able to talk at another conference, the F-Sharp Conf online, and somebody actually got inspired in creating a Visual Studio plugin. So Visual Studio and I, we, we broke up a couple of years ago. I'm kind of a writer fan now, but um, yeah, Phantom has never really got there. And I was just, you know, I can only cover so much ground, but then a wonderful young man um, created this yeah, this formatting tool, it works really well. I saw the code creators were really impressed. Like he just used the Phantom uh, library, the code, and just integrated this into a Visual Studio extension. And now you kind of have it everywhere. So it was really amazing to see that, you know, people are getting invested in this. So that's really good. So to wrap up the next major version, what's it about? It's about the GB Substomp guides. So they've been uh, extending the contract and now we're getting something that they can use internally so that's that's really great if large code bases on the enterprise level get this formatting you just it reaches such a higher um, level of quality there there's an improved performance I'll get to that um, we did some things that you know people have complained that if you use Fable or one of the other web frameworks it doesn't really do the DSL formatting that good and we we'll try to work on that as well so there's like better support now for that and um, it's all about, you know, trying to get more people on board and using this. 
Um, similar with editor config, we used to have our own JSON formats to have your configuration, but we, you know, said, hey, editor config is kind of a standard, so let's try and, and move to that. I was a bit hesitant on that one at the beginning, but um, yeah, it, it is a good standard, so it's, it's good to have your things um, over there now. Um, as I mentioned, we are producing some benchmarks. Uh, the graph you see here is that we it used to take 50 seconds to format a file of 4,000 lines, and now it takes 5 seconds, um, which is still long for a code formatter, but you know, it's a large file, so we're, we're getting there. Um, good. Well, it's one hell of dirty. So, some some closing thoughts. I um, I entered this project from sort of from zero to hero. I knew nothing about the compiler. I you know was in over my head and you know, reaching out to people and collaborating and then you know discovering things, putting the effort in it. It really gets you there. Um, goodwill and enthusiasm are fine, but this project really grew by some uh, yeah by the people of Chiro, just by some financial support by you know, getting this into a, a higher level of quality. And that's something you just can't always achieve on uh, on your own in, in your free time. So I'm really, um, I'm really grateful that they, they you know, chose to embark on this uh, adventure. I overcame a lot of, you know, I learned technical things, but I overcame some, some personal challenges. I, I took a leap of faith, um, similar to what I'm doing here with this, with this whole talking at a conference thing. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a bit scared here, but you know, you just you start doing it and you start getting people involved and the, the road is still long because the, the end of this visual would then be that Phantoms ends up in the F sharp compiler. Um but you know, we're getting there and, and it's getting better and better. So I hope one day I'll uh, I'll see the end of that road. Okay, um many thanks for, for having me. I was Florian and Verdunk, you can find me on Twitter, you can find me on GitHub. Um, slides will be up there. And yeah, this concludes my talk. Many thanks, .NET Summit, for having me. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Stay safe. Goodbye.